Well, we're continuing in our series on 1 Samuel. Uh, the plan, just so you know, is that I am going to go through chapter 15, uh, which is the end, if you would, of sort of the focus on Saul. Starting in chapter 16, it'll shift in the book to focusing on David. We'll stop at 15, and we'll pick up 16 next year. So I don't want to go... I've been in churches where they'll do like Romans for three years, and it's just too long. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a break after chapter 15 and, and shift to a different series. But right now, we're in chapter 13. And I've called this message, How to Respond When Your Sin Finds You Out. And do you ever wonder what sort of sin your pastor struggles with? I don't know if you have. I, I've wondered before when I've been under the leadership of somebody else. And so here's public confession. Uh, I don't know if this is the number one sin that I struggle with, but I think it is. So here we go. I struggle with impatience. I am really an impatient person. I, I put on a very good face and facade here when I'm at church, but it, to be completely transparent with you, I am really an impatient person. And that never... The best manifestation of that, or the worst manifestation of that, depending on your point of view, is when I'm driving. Really, I, I, I am impatient. And um, when I'm driving, like in Holland, and look, if you've ever lived in Chicago like I have, or and in any other big city, or even in Ireland, in Dublin, downtown Dublin, we don't really know what traffic is like here, okay, in West Michigan. We don't really have, like, traffic jams like they have there. And yet... I've adjusted to my environment, and if the person in front of me refuses to go right on a, on a stop sign or a red light, I get very impatient, and I'm like, and I talk to him when I'm alone, and I'm like, ah, come on, you can turn right on a red in Michigan, you know, like, I just, like, I talk to him, and I'm impatient, and one of my greatest fears, really, this is one of my greatest fears, one of my greatest fears is that I'll get animated, and be like, oh, come on. And then the person will look in the rearview mirror and it'll be one of you. <laughs> and then I'll be like, oh, no. Oh, no. I blew it. That's one of my greatest fears. I'm just, I know it's going to happen someday. And then you're going to go, hmm, yes, I need to talk to the pastor about that. Impatience may seem to us like one of the lesser sins, really, when we think about it. But I'll tell you what. In today's narrative, we're going to discover that impatience can lead to some serious consequences. It may seem little, but it can be actually quite huge. We're going to look at that this morning, but before I do, let us, let us pray together. Lord, I, I thank you for the privilege of being able to open your word. We ask, Lord, that you would teach us this morning, open our eyes. Break down our barriers and our walls and help us to have receptive ears and receptive hearts. And I ask this in your name we pray. Amen. I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation this morning. Normally we follow uh, the ESV. If you have the ESV, verse 1, I mean right, off the, right out of the gate, the ESV is a bit of a challenge here. And that's because verse 1 is a challenge in the Hebrew. But I, I do think... The NLT has uh, captured it the best. So we're just going to go ahead and do the NLT this morning, and it'll be on the screen for you uh, if you don't have one of those. So here we go. Let's start off and look at verse 1. We read, Saul was 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned for 42 years. Saul selected 3,000 special troops from the army of Israel and sent the rest, rest of the men home. He took 2,000 of the chosen men with him to Michmash in the hill country of Bethel. The other 1,000 went with Saul's son Jonathan to Gibeah in the land of Benjamin. Soon after this, Jonathan attacked and defeated the garrison of Philistines at Geba, or Geba, as it's properly pronounced. All right, we're going to break this down as we go through this chapter. The first thing we discover is Saul as king. And we read, Saul was 30 years old. 
So when he became king and he reigned over Israel for 42 years. This is what we call the king formula in the Old Testament. And if you read the book of First or Second Kings, and you're going through that, you'll see this formula over and over and over. You'll get to a new chapter or a new narrative, and you'll read something like, uh, so-and-so died uh, at, uh, after so many years, and so-and-so, um, when they were such and such an age, became king over Israel or king over Judah. So this here, this verse where it says, Saul was 30 years old when he became king. This is the king formula. And so we see this more or less as the moment in the first Samuel where we are being introduced to Saul as king. Even though up to now they've been calling, you know, they've been um, uh, calling him king or they've been in, in referring to him as king, here is in the text, in the narrative, where he's officially being introduced as king. And this is typical of Israelite historiography, as I said. And we're going to discover that he is, in fact, a king just like all the other nations have. And that's not a positive thing. That's not a positive thing at all. Verses 2 and 3, gathering an army. Verse 2, we see that Saul has selected special troops. These are his Navy SEALs, his Delta Force, his special forces, and he's gathered the number, he's divided them into two companies. And if you have a map on the back of your bulletin, which you should, you can see in your map where he goes. In the middle, you will notice that we have, right there in the middle, uh, we have Jerusalem, which is called Jebus. Jebus. Uh, because right now it isn't Jerusalem yet. And we'll discover later that David will be, in fact, the one who will capture Jerusalem. Right now, under Saul's kingdom, we got all this area here, except for Jebus, except for future Jerusalem. And the rest is Philistine or other Canaanite, Ammonite, Moabite territory. And we can see in the text that we have this area right here in the middle, very, very middle called Michmash, and here's Gilgal, and here's Gibeah. This area right here is the heart, I mean, the very heart of Saul's territory, of Saul's kingdom. His capital is right there, Gibeah. That's his capital. And we are told, aha, that there's a problem at Michmash. So this is very, very close to the capital. He cannot ignore this. Saul will go with 2,000 men to Michmash, and Jonathan, his son, will go with 1,000 to Gibeah. And he'll take 1,000 of these elite troops, and he's going to attack the Philistines, and he's going to win. He's going to win. The rest of verse 3 through verse 7 is stirring a hornet's nest. The news spread quickly among the Philistines. So Saul blew the ram's horn throughout the land, saying, Hebrews, hear this. Rise up and revolt. All Israel heard the news that Saul had destroyed the Philistine garrison at Geba and that the Philistines now hated the Israelites more than ever. Interesting. So the entire Israelite army was summoned to join Saul at Gilgal. We're, t we're told that all of Israel heard how Jonathan and his special forces had defeated the Philistines. Had defeated the Philistines... And you can be sure that not just all of Israel heard that. So did all of Philistia, all of the Philistines. And they're ticked. They're angry. In fact, they hate Israel now more than they have ever hated Israel. And Saul, justifiably, is expecting a retaliation. He's expecting a response from the Philistines. And so he sends out word to everyone. Be prepared. Rise up. Grab your, your, your spears. Grab your whatever you can grab. And join me in defending Israel. In fact, the rest of the Israelite army mobilizes and joins Saul at Gilgal. I'm going to stop here for a second. And I want us to consider the context within the chapters before because that's really important when you're interpreting Scripture. So let's think about where we're at for a minute. 
Because see, under Samuel, not that long ago, God had driven out the Philistines. Do you remember that? Under Samuel, the Philistines were driven out. And if you look at chapter 7, there was peace in Israel, no problem with the Philistines, all during Samuel's leadership. All during his leadership, there was peace. But now that Saul is the leader, things have changed. The Philistines are back. They're a problem again. So Saul chooses 3,000 men to counter this threat. And it's interesting because a few chapters earlier, Samuel told the people, when they asked for a king, he warned them. He said in chapter 8, verse 11, if you, if you choose a king, that king will take your sons. He'll take your sons. And you know what? We find out that that is exactly what's happening. It's already happening now, but in the next chapter, we read this. We read, when Saul saw any strong man or any valiant man, he took him for himself. So Saul will go by, and he will see this young man. He'll say, wow, look at those muscles. Come on, you're with me. And dad will go, wait a minute, I need him to run the farm. Sorry, I need him for the army. So he is doing exactly what kings do in those days. Now, as far as the Philistines are concerned, really up to now they've paid very little attention to the Israelites. They came and they have threatened the capital of Gibeah and they're making some incursions. But for the most, they must have had a very good reason for that. But for the most part, they haven't really cared about the Israelites. But boy, that is going to change now. Jonathan's defeat of the Philistine garrison has stirred up a hornet's nest. The Philistines mustered a mighty army of 3,000 chariots, 6,000 charioteers, and as many warriors as the grains of sand on the seashore. They camped at Michmash, east of beth Aven. The men of Israel saw what a tight spot they were in, and because they were hard-pressed by the enemy, they tried to hide in caves, thickets, rocks, holes, and cisterns. Some of them crossed the Jordan River and escaped into the land of Gad and Gilead. Uh, you can read between the lines, the Philistines have come back, and they have come back in force. They're angry, and they're full on. This is all-out war now, and the Israelites are not even remotely prepared for this. Not even close. In fact, they have come on so fiercely that the Israelites are hiding. Some of them have fled to the other side of the Jordan and put as much distance between them and the Philistines as they can get. Others are hiding in cisterns and caves and all of that. This is war. It's interesting that we have a, almost word for word the same phrase. This is the NLT, so it's worded the way they word it. But it, almost the same phrase that we find in the book of Genesis, when God promised Abraham that his descendants would be as numerous as the sand on the seashore, now this, that's the same words are being used of the Philistine army. So, sure, I think it's a bit of hyperbole. I think it's a bit of an exaggeration. But the point is this. The point is this. The Philistine army response, their response was epic. And the Israelites' reaction is what you expect when an army that size descends upon you. They, they weren't, they're not ready, and they have fled. They're hiding. They're hiding out. That sets the stage for what happens next. When Saul, by the way, this is Michmash. And I want to show you this because I think this is important. Up here we have Michmash, which is now a modern-day Arab village. And so it's interesting that the Arab village is right on top of ancient Michmash. So it has maintained uh, civilization for thousands of years. But this is Michmash up here. And then there's this, you can't quite see here, but there's this ravine, a little easier to see right here, sort of the, the deep ravine that sort of separates that from beth Aven. So what we have here is the Philistine army occupying the upper part of that slide and the Israel army on the other side of that ravine. That The topography has helped out the Israelites a little bit here to be able to defend themselves for the moment. For the moment. Caught in the act. Meanwhile, Saul stayed at Gilgal, 
and his men were trembling with fear. Saul waited there seven days for Samuel, as Samuel had instructed him earlier, but Samuel still didn't come. Saul realized that his troops were rapidly slipping away, so he demanded, Bring me the burnt offering and the peace offerings. And Saul sacrificed the burnt offering himself. And just as Saul was finishing with the burnt offering, Samuel arrived, caught in the act. And this is a turning point in Saul's life. It's going to be all downhill from here. Now, the details of this are important. They're very, very important. See, Saul had an arrangement with Samuel. Samuel will come to offer a sacrifice and bless the army. That's the arrangement. We, we see that a few chapters earlier. But where is he? Where's Samuel? It's been seven days now. Saul's army is starting to scatter. In fact, Saul's army is shrinking by the hour. It's shrinking by the hour. And Saul, no surprise, is getting impatient. He's getting impatient. He's getting worried. You can imagine Saul scanning the horizon. Where is that prophet? Waiting and waiting and waiting for Samuel. I'm sure he probably had sentries out looking for him, servants out looking for him, saying, the minute you see the prophet Samuel, you notify me immediately. But Samuel hasn't come. And eventually, Saul's impatience is going to win him over. And then he does something really offensive to God. Really offensive to God. He offers a sacrifice to himself. Now, why is that so bad? Why is it so bad that he did it himself? Well, we're going to look into that. But if you were to read Leviticus chapter 1 through chapter 7, just the first seven chapters of Leviticus, you'll discover that according to the law of God, only a priest is allowed to do what Saul did. Now remember that Samuel is both a prophet and a priest. So Samuel is allowed to do that. Samuel can do it. Saul cannot. Saul must wait for Samuel. But instead, he decides to offer the sacrifice himself. He breaks the law. And right when he does it, who should show up but Samuel? And Saul is caught in the act. Verses 10 through 12. Excuses, excuses, excuses. Saul went out to meet and welcome him. But Samuel said, what is this you have done? Saul replied, I saw my men scattering from me, and you didn't arrive when you said you would. And the Philistines are at ready for battle. So I said, the Philistines are ready to march against us at Gilgal, and I haven't even asked for the Lord's help. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering myself before you came. Wow, 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 wow. Saul. Oh, Saul. Can you imagine the scene? Samuel shows up. Saul went out to meet him, probably with a relieved smile on his face. Samuel's finally arrived. He'll know what to do, but that smile quickly fades when Samuel says, what have you done? Saul, what have you done? Oh, wow. Interesting. Reminds me of what God said to Adam and Eve. What have you done? Or when Cain murdered Abel, and God said to Cain, what have you done? And here the prophet asks, asks Saul the same words. You can almost see the shock on Saul's face. And then he responds. And I wonder, was it with justification or was it with anger? See, if it was uh, justification then I can read the words with a certain tone, a certain, I can read it a certain way. I had no choice, Samuel. My, my army's fleeing. The Israelite army, they're running. Like by the hour, I'm losing them. They're hiding in caves. They're hiding in ravines. I mean, the Philistines are here. What was I supposed to do? You weren't here. 
I have an obligation as a king. Or did he respond in anger? What do you mean, what have I done, Samuel? Where were you? I've been waiting for you. You said you were going to be here. You haven't come when you said. Did you go on vacation? Did you go to the spa? I mean, where have you been? Don't ask me, what have I done? I'm the king. I did what I had to do. Excuse me. Hmm. I wonder. Did he respond with justification? Or did he respond in anger? You know what? So often, when we're caught in sin, we re tend to react in one of those two ways. We tend to either try to justify our sin, or we get angry and we try to cover it up because we're embarrassed. After David sinned with Bathsheba, he did neither. If you study the text in 2 Samuel chapter 12, fascinating text, one of my favorite narratives in the Bible, where Nathan confronts David, gives him the story about a rich man stealing a neighbor's sheep, and all that, you probably know the story. But when he gets confronted, you should look at it this week. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 12. Do you know that David's response to being called out when Nathan says, you are the man you've sent? Do you know what the Bible says? David said just six words. I have sinned against the Lord. That's all he says. No excuses. He doesn't try to justify himself. He doesn't get angry. In humility, he says, I have sinned. Saul, on the other hand, wow. Excuse after excuse. And then he shifts the blame. And you go, well, really? Yeah, it's much easier to see in the Hebrew than it is in the English. But once I point it out to you, you'll always see it. See, Hebrew has a way of adding emphasis it gets technical because we have what are called personal pronouns, but every once in a while, Hebrew has a way of attaching an appendix to a word, to a personal pronoun, and that total purpose of that is to add emphasis to that particular word. And it's there in this text, not in the English, but in the Hebrew. It's right there when Saul says, I saw my, skin sin, my men scattering for me, and you, that's where it gets the emphasis in the Hebrew. You didn't arrive when you said you would. That's called shifting the blame. Saul is shifting the blame to Samuel. I did what I did because you didn't show up on time. When we're caught in sin, called out by someone, a friend, a spouse, a parent or a sibling, someone close to us. Look, at we can either respond like David, just humbly confess our sin, or we can be like sin, we can, or Saul. We can try to justify it, shift the blame, make excuses. Let me just say this as clear as I can say it. You will gain nothing if you respond like Saul. Ever. You'll, you'll never gain anything responding like that. You only make a bad situation worse. And in Saul's case, Samuel is going to get the last word. Paradise lost. How foolish, Samuel ex exclaimed. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. Had you kept it, the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now, your kingdom must end. For the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. The Lord has already appointed him to be the leader of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. Wow. Wow. If Saul expected a warm welcome from Samuel, boy, he got a big surprise. Samuel says, how foolish, or in some English translations, you have done a foolish thing. Now, I'd like to clarify something because our English language, our culture is a little different here. When we think of someone being called a fool, we kind of think that's like a synonym for idiot. 
No, no, no. In the Bible, it's much, much more than that. Uh, it's more theological. I'll give you an example. In Psalm 41, or Psalm 14, verse 1, we read this. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. This is a great verse for explaining what that word means in the Hebrew. In other words, the psalmist isn't saying that a fool is an atheist. That's probably how we look at that. No, not at all. A, a fool is someone who lived as though God does not exist and or that God does not matter. Clearly, I think Saul believes that God exists. But in this case, I think he doesn't see that God matters. In other words, Saul's problem was that he acted as though God would not. So he did not keep the Lord's command because he did not trust the Lord. It's a problem we have. There's just something much deeper going on here in Saul's heart. And then Samuel says to him, you have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. And that, according to Samuel, is what a fool does. That's what a fool does. Now, this is interesting because we've got to look back here to figure out what Samuel's talking about. The command that Samuel had not kept was the command given in 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 8. If you follow the text and trace the threads, you'll see what's going on here. And what does it say in 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 8? It says that Saul is to wait seven days until Samuel comes to him, and then Samuel will show him what to do. Oh, wow. That changes a little bit of that text for me. Because when I read it without going back to the discussion that Saul had with Samuel, this is how I read it. Here's Saul waiting for Samuel. Day one, he doesn't show up. Day two, he doesn't show up. Day three, he doesn't show up. It's the seventh day, and Samuel is still not here. So I'm going to just do it myself. Saul, Samuel told you that he would not show up until the seventh day. So what we really have is Saul is waiting. This text that we've just read, this narrative we've just read, isn't Saul waiting day one, day two, day... No! We're talking about the seventh day. And Saul is waiting, and Saul is waiting, and Saul is waiting, and Samuel still doesn't show up. Saul, what are you doing? Waiting for hours? It's the seventh day, and Samuel hasn't showed up yet. That's pretty serious impatience. Are you following me? Let me, let me say it again, lest I lost you. Samuel says to Saul, back in chapter 10, I will come to you after seven days, and I'll tell you what to do. In other words, I'll give you a word from the Lord on, on how this is going to get resolved. And Saul waits, but on the seventh day, Samuel doesn't come fast enough. And so he does it himself. Saul didn't offer the sacrifice on the eighth day. He offered it on the seventh day because he could not wait. He could not wait to the end of that day. That's all he had to do. But he lost faith. He's in a tight situation and his army is in trouble. And maybe the Bible doesn't tell us everything. Maybe he sees the Philistines slowly advancing. I don't know. But he is afraid. You know what? To obey God in circumstances like that requires us to trust Him. It requires us to trust Him. Sometimes against every instinct, against the, all the evidence that we see, against every experience uh, that, that we know. Look at the Philistines are continuing to advance in superior numbers, and Saul was supposed to do what? Wait? Yeah. He was supposed to wait. Let's apply this for a second. 
Obeying God is not always convenient. It's not always convenient. It isn't always easy. It isn't always uh, straightforward or simple. Obeying God takes faith. So let me give you some advice. Don't be impatient. And I'm telling this to myself as well. Don't be, wait upon the Lord. It is always the wise thing to wait upon the Lord. Here are just a few verses that I'll testify to this truth. Psalm 27, 14. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Psalm 130. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in his word, I put my hope. Isaiah. The Lord longs to be gracious to you. Blessed are all who wait for him. I'll tell you what. That is just a sampling of what the Bible has to say about waiting on the Lord. There are loads of verses that I could have cho chosen. Samuel needed to wait so Samuel gives this indictment, and he says to Saul these words, words that will haunt Saul for the rest of his life. But now your kingdom must end, for the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. Now, we should talk about this for a second, because I think this verse is frequently misunderstood. This is not an expression of the future king's godliness. I think that's how we often read this. Later. There'll be a statement about that. But here, that's not what it's talking about. Right now, this is emphasizing God's heart. Here's a paraphrase that'll help us understand it. But now your kingdom must end, for the Lord has sought out a man of his own choosing, a man God has set his heart on. That's what the text is saying. The Lord has chosen David. He's chosen the next king. And it won't be a king like other nations. It won't be the king that the people chose. They chose Saul. God will choose David. Doesn't mean David will be perfect. But this is still the one that God has chosen. This is terrible, terrible news to Saul. His kingdom is lost. His son Jonathan will not inherit the throne. Saul just finds it out right now. Not only will Jonathan not inherit the throne, none of his children will inherit the throne. Saul's dynasty, Saul's legacy will be him and him alone. And it may seem like a particularly harsh punishment, but is it really? Really, is it? Saul does things that look good on the outside. You know, he, he enacts worship, he makes a sacrifice to God, he prepares people for battle. I mean, when he does this, it looks good. It looks worthy. It looks honorable. But you know what it is? It's a lie. Saul did nothing in that moment to bring glory or honor to God. In fact, he broke the law. He broke the law. What he really did was he did it for himself. And let me just tell you something. Listen closely to me because this is really important. Like Saul... We can have the appearance of faith. But without authentic faith, we're in trouble. It is so easy, and you know it's true, especially in West, Mich West Michigan. It is so easy to look like a Christian. I don't know of any place in the United States that's easier than West Michigan to look like a Christian. Please, there is a difference between the appearance of faith and authentic faith. And Saul is a good example of that. We all know that a tree that is rooted in the ground in good soil and watered regularly, that tree will grow. That tree will grow strong, and the Bible gives all, all kinds of illustrations of this and poetic examples and it'll bear fruit but the christmas tree on the other hand wow 
Christmas trees are beautiful and they're colored with ornaments, decorations, and blinking lights. And we look at it and we go, wow, and we turn off the lights and it glows. And we look at a Christmas, at least I do, like I'll look at it for a long time, just kind of staring at it, and just enjoying the Christmas tree. Anybody else do that? Am I the only one? Just, oh, you know, it's just beautiful on the outside. But after it's been in the house for a while, it starts to deteriorate. And then the needles start to fall off as it slowly dies, and then our Christmas tree gets tossed out, making good firewood. Likewise, we will slowly decay. We, we, we will not bear fruit if we're not planted in the Lord. If we do not have authentic faith, we may fool some people, but we will never fool the Lord. Never. Well, let me, let me start to bring this to a conclusion here. Um, you, you probably won't believe what I'm about to say, but that's okay. I believe it. I've been in ministry long enough that I, I believe this to be true. And that is this. When you have sinned against the Lord, as Numbers 32, 23 says, be sure your sin will find you out. I truly believe that. I truly believe that whatever it is that you and I struggle with eventually it will come to light. It just will. We've seen it in our own church. And when it does, are we going to be like Adam? When the Holy Spirit asks you, what have you done? We can either respond with, it was Eve. Eve. She made me do it. She gave it to me. It's her fault. Saul is just being human. He's got a human nature. It goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. Blame shifting. That's our go-to. Or we can be like David and say, I've sinned. I am to blame and only I am to blame and I'm sorry. Forgive me. John says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. But if we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar. And his word has no place in our lives. That, that would be Saul. And as I reflect on these narratives that we've been looking at in 1 Samuel, I'm even more convinced than I ever have been. That we need a king who will not only rescue us from our enemies, we need a king who will rescue us from ourselves. There is this field, very interesting field, called theological psychology. And last night I woke up at about 3.30 in the morning, and I didn't go to sleep till about 4.30. Because I prayed something, and I, I'm not going to say that I shouldn't have prayed. I obviously should have. But I prayed something before I went to bed last night, and the Lord answered my prayer. I said, Lord, before I went to bed, I said, please reveal to me what it is that you want to say. I've come up with this text. I've been working on it all week, but if there's something more Open my eyes. So he did that at 3.30 in the morning. I just woke up, and I kid you not, I woke up at 3.30 last night, and thoughts started hitting my head immediately about this message. Now, that doesn't really happen very often. Usually I kind of slowly come to, you know, and I realize I'm in my bedroom. I'm sleeping. Oh, what time is it? You know, but I woke up, boom, with these thoughts about this message. And they were all what I call theological psychology. And it's this. All of us want to be like God. That is the very core temptation that Satan threw at Adam and Eve. Go ahead. Take that fruit. 
Because if you do, what will happen? What's the text say? You'll be like God. And I thought about Saul and what's going on here in this narrative. And it struck me last night at the middle of the night. Saul is king. And he doesn't want to give up any of that. And we'll see that in his life as he goes crazy chasing David all over the land. It drives him crazy. The Bible tells us that he's, he suffers from a, a, an evil spirit. He is jealous for his throne, jealous for that power. And all of us desire, to some extent, that power. Let me, let me, let me make this simple. All of us want to be on the throne of our lives. All of us want to be in control and in charge. And what we want God for is the same thing that Samuel, or that Saul, excuse me, wanted God for. Why did he, was he waiting for Samuel? The Bible says he's waiting for Samuel because Samuel will tell him what to do. We want God when he's convenient. When our health starts to break down, we get a bad uh, result, test result from the doctors, we go to God. I need you right now. Please come here and help in my situation. When we're struggling with a relationship, a relation breaks down, we don't know where to go. We're looking for an answer. God, would you solve this? God is great when things are not. But in regular, ordinary life, when everything is well, my job is good, my health is good, my relationships are good, man, I'm making good money, and all this stuff, and I'm independent. I mean, you know what? God takes a back burner. Have you noticed? So go back to the very, very beginning. All of us struggle the same way that Adam did, the same way that Saul did. We, we want the power. We don't want to really give up anything that we don't have to. But, but I was thinking last night, but what does God want? Do you know what God wants? God wants to walk in the garden with us. He wants a relationship with us. He wants to do life with us. He created us to be in a relationship with him. He doesn't want to be our, our MD or our, you know, our, our, our insurance plan. He, he, he is those things, but he wants to be more than that. He wants to be in a relationship with us. And so I'm thinking this morning about Becky's first song about read your Bible, pray every day. You know, I don't know about you. I'm in my mid-50s, and I'm still waiting for that day when I'll be walking outside, and all of a sudden God will show up right in front of me. Hello, Jonathan. You know? And I have a really good suspicion that I will die before I will ever see that. And you want to know why? Because the Bible tells us that God is so holy that no one can ever look upon him and live. You and I might have this secret desire. We wish we could see God, but guess what? We can't. Well, we die because we can't look at him. So he communicates to us differently through what we see out here, through, through nature and what he's created and through his word. If we're not in his word, we're not really walking with him. We're not walking in the garden with them. That's how he primarily does it. There's what? How many billion people on this earth? I mean, if every single one of us was a follower of Jesus, which is what it's going to be like when we get to heaven someday, it's going to be a little different. But right now on earth, if everybody was a follower of Jesus, guess how he would communicate with every one of us? Every four, five, six, seven, eight, ten billion, I don't know how many there are. He would communicate still with us through his word. And so I open his word and I spend time with him. But most of us in this room, I suspect, are not doing that. We're only doing it when it's convenient or when we need something. Or when things aren't just right. 
But see, if we live like that too long, we're, we're going to become like Saul. Read your Bible, pray every day. And not only will you grow, 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 but you'll live, live, live with Jesus. Let me ask you, what does your kingdom look like? Especially you dads. You know, like, yeah, I have my kingdom. Yep. I got my queen, my kids, my subjects. What's your kingdom look like? Let me tell you about somebody whose kingdom will never end. Who's always trustworthy, always honorable, always dependable, always merciful, always gracious, always forgiving and loving and kind. And who wants to spend every second that we'll give with him, give to him. His name is Jesus, and he's the true king. Amen? Let's pray.